Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, Shirley Leakin uh, from the Four Seasons Garden Club. There is a three-day bus trip to Kansas City, June 23rd through the 25th, and the sign-up sheet is in the back. Is that right, Shirley? Okay, so if you're interested in that, it's $275 for two uh, in a room or $375 for a single room, and it says that they do the Kansas City Arboretum, Botanical Gardens, Powell Gardens, Orchid Cave, my gosh, you get this all done in that short a time. <laughs> it sounds like a really nice trip. And also, I'm sad to announce, but um, apparently Nancy Cyberling passed away in January, and I'm sorry, I totally missed that and did not know that, so I wanted everybody to be sure. She was one of the founders of Project Green itself, and a great, great lady. I was very lucky to have known her. Uh, when we were brainstorming for ideas on speakers, both my co-chair, Jan Carpenter, and another lady that's very active in Project Green, Diane Allen, suggested we do something with the beautiful gardens of Bruce Moore. And in case you don't see them here, uh, one is in Florida, and the other one has gone out of town with her husband. So neither one of them are going to see this presentation, but they're the ones that were really asking about it. And I thought it sounded like a great opportunity for us to learn some more about something that's only 25 miles away from us and that we could possibly uh, take tours of it. It's right off of First Avenue and David will tell you a little bit more about Bruce Moore itself and the family. Uh, David Morton is our guest speaker today. He is the head gardener at Bruce Moore and he studied horticulture and worked since 1986 including an apprenticeship for this, a season at the Huntington Library in Pasadena, California. Yeah, everybody, ooh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> His main focus was old garden roses, but he has now turned to perennials and annuals. And the 1910 landscape designs of Bruce Moore include a variety of plants and trees and carrying on the work of noted gardener Irene Douglas. Mr. Morton is key in maintaining the formal. There's a number of gardens up there. Formal, the children's garden, the night gardens, as well as a pond an orchard and woodland areas. So on that note, I will turn this over to Mr. Morton. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's on. Is it on? Good. Good. Well, thank you. Uh, this is quite a turnout. I didn't know what to expect, but my goodness. Uh, I always like the opportunity to talk about Bruce Moore. It's quite a place to work. I really love working there. I've been there since uh, 2005, so in March it'll be uh, going on 10 years. Um, there's quite a tradition there, and I thought today I would um, talk a little bit about the, uh, a look at the history of Bruce Moore, so you have a little bit of background about the history of the place. Um, also discuss a little bit about O.C. Simons, who was uh, instrumental in designing the 26-acre estate, uh, as well as other uh, areas in the, in the country. Um, talk a little bit about the grounds of the estate, of course, the formal garden of the estate, which is my favorite part of the estate, and uh, the preservation of the estate. We just recently had a historic landscape report done by um, Iowa State University uh, over the past two or three years, um, <clears throat> and it's quite interesting to get that perspective and really uh, discern how you're going to um, preserve this place. Is it preservation or, or how, you know, is it uh, restoration? Um, and so when you're working with a living collection, which is what the term I like to use because these are living uh, plants out there on the estate, uh, how do you uh, go forward uh, keeping the tradition of the original landscape design but also uh, remembering how we're using the estate now and how, how all that works together. Um, <clears throat> so without further ado, I'll go to the next slide here. See if I can figure this out. Yay! So, uh, there were three families that lived at Bruce Moore. Uh, the first was Caroline Sinclair. And uh, Caroline Sinclair bought the uh, 10 acres of the estate at the time. It was only 10 acres. In 1884, and she built that mansion that you see there for $55,000, which was a deal. No. Um, and the Sinclair fortune uh, was in the meatpacking industry. Uh, she wanted to raise her children out in the country. Uh, and uh, also her brother, I think it was her brother, owned the, uh, a lot next door to her house, or to where she built the house, which is one of the reasons I think she chose this area to build the house. And uh, back then it was in the country, now it's pretty much in the middle of the city. <coughs> so then the second family to live there was the Douglas family. 
and they were there from 1906 to uh, 1937. Uh, they increased the size of the property from the 10 acres that uh, Mrs. Sinclair had to about 37 acres. Um, and she hired O.C. Simons to design her country estate. Um, she installed the carriage house, which we have, now there, which we have there now, uh, the servants' duplexes, the, child, the chicken coop, the Lord and Burnham greenhouse. Many of the buildings that are now on the estate were put on by the Douglas family. And uh, the Douglas era is also our interpretive era, <coughs> uh, as they had added many of these landscape features, these outbuildings uh, that we still have uh, today. Uh, Mrs. Douglas also installed the formal garden. Uh, she was an avid plants woman and she liked to garden herself and uh, would often, I, I've read in different uh, diary entries uh, that I've been able to uncover of hers about uh, different plants she would see in her own travels and she would uh, communicate those to her gardener, who uh, Archie White, and, and in hopes that he would find some of these interesting plants to use in her, in her garden. So she was really quite involved in the whole uh, makeup of the estate. Uh, George Douglas Sr. was a founding partner of Douglas and Stewart, which later merged to become Quaker Oats. And his son, George Bruce Douglas, who was the Bruce Moore residence, and Walter Douglas, uh, his brother, they formed uh, Douglas and Company, which was a linseed oil company, and Douglas Starch Works, which produced cornstarch products. <coughs> Then the uh, third family to live there was the Hall family, <coughs> and they lived there from 1937 until 1981. Uh, they were the last family to live on the estate at Bruce Moore. They actually ended up selling off 11 acres and made it to the 26 acres that it is uh, today. Um, Margaret Douglas was the eldest of three daughters of uh, George and Irene Douglas. Uh, she inherited the property after her mother Irene passed away, which was in 1937. Uh, Margaret moved to the estate when she was 10, actually, uh, and she actually grew up on the estate because the, uh, <coughs> the Douglases actually swapped houses with Mrs. Sinclair. When they purchased the house from uh, Mrs. Sinclair, uh, Mrs. Sinclair actually moved to their house, which was closer to the city on First Avenue there. Um, <coughs> and it was one of the largest sales or real estate transactions of the time. So she actually, so Margaret Hall, when she was 10, moved from that house to the estate. Uh, she married Howard Hall in 1924. Um, they never had children, but uh, their legacy lives on today. Uh, she was the one that actually bequeathed the property to the National Trust in 1981. Uh, her, um, uh, she also um, allowed her servants, uh, after she had passed, uh, she uh, wanted her servants to have lifetime tenancy there. So uh, her cook slash maid still lived on the property even after it became a National Trust site. And uh, she had a, um, her bookkeeper still lived on the site. Uh, they've all since passed away, but, but uh, she was a very forward-thinking um, woman, and I'm glad she actually uh, gave the site to the National Trust for Historic Preservation because the 11 acres that they ended up selling off have something like six or seven houses on them now. So the whole area would have been different. Um, <coughs> so O.C. Simons, I want to go back to him. He uh, was an American landscape designer born near Grand's, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, he always preferred the title landscape gardener as opposed to a landscape architect. Um, uh, many of his designs and works are listed on the U.S. National, uh, on the US National Register of Historic Places. He studied civil engineering at the University of Michigan, and he was commissioned to extend Graceland Cemetery in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, he was an architect, or uh, his, he had a colleagues, uh, William Holdebrad, and he created um, uh, sort of a firm to uh, finish up this Graceland job, because it was a rather large job. And in 1981, a third partner joined him, Martin Roche. And then in 1883, 1881, 1883, Simons left that firm and he, um, to pursue his own consultations and designs. And uh, he started, he worked on um, Lake Forest Cemetery in Lake Forest, Illinois, Lincoln Park in Chicago, Illinois, Riverview Park, and even uh, uh, Oakland Cemetery, which is right by, in the southeast side of Cedar Rapids. So he was pretty well known for his designs, and he had a naturalistic sort of prairie style design to these um, estates that he would work on. And he always used natives of the area, wherever he was, whether it was Florida or Chicago or Iowa. 
he liked to incorporate these broad views and uh, he created these little enclosed spaces or rooms throughout the prop, uh, property. And um, <clears throat> just a very interesting idea of design and he had a great influence in the whole industry in terms of that. <clears throat> Uh, so I find him interesting. So we use him a lot in terms of when we're uh, forced to make changes on the property or, or uh, if any situation comes up where we need to uh, think about how we're going to preserve the place going forward. His works are, are uh, highly um, considered when, I, when we're doing all that. Um, I like to call it one of the community's homes, Bruce Moore. These are the current boundaries of the estate. Um, <coughs> We have seven venues, including a garden art show. We have classics at Bruce Moore. We have Bruce Moore Orchestra. We have Cabaret, Balloon and Glow. Uh, we have Modern Salon. We have Outdoor Children's Theater. And so the challenges of uh, maintaining the historic integrity uh, with the use as a, as a community cultural center is the challenge I, we find uh, on the grounds team. Uh, we have a formal garden, we have a cutting garden, we have a vegetable garden, we have an orchard, we have a pond, we have um, a night garden, which is a specialty garden that was part of the, uh, oh, um, one of the ideas of a country estate was to have specialty gardens. Uh, and we have a woodland area, and we have a huge, vast front lawn. There's nine buildings. There's a mansion, there's a garden house, there's a servant's duplex, there's uh, the Lord and Burnham greenhouse, which we just recently restored. Uh, there's a carriage house, there's a maintenance building, there's a Ludi greenhouse, which is our um, uh, newest greenhouse, um, and there's a book bindery and a chicken coop. Uh, so there's a lot of buildings to take care of, let me tell you. <coughs> and uh, there's challenges uh, in the cost to maintain those historic structures, uh, and so we rely on memberships and corporate sponsorships and corporate members and private donations and attendance to our events. Um, and Mrs. Hall also, uh, I've read uh, in many excerpts from different archives that she really wanted Bruce Moore to be a community center and not so much a shrine to her family. So, um, but it's hard not to at least mention that <laughs> when you're talking about Bruce Moore, that's for sure. Um, so this is the formal garden. This is my favorite part of the estate. Um, this top picture is the formal garden this past summer and this one is circa 1915. Um, <coughs> This was installed, the garden was uh, originally installed in about 1910, and it originally was planted in a prairie style. And what that meant was that you would have formal in the sense of formal beds. There's these geometric shaped beds, if you see them, and they're all throughout the garden. And so there's like a little rooms within the garden. And that, may, that was sort of the formal design. Um, but the plantings, instead of having the, the um, sort of a formal look of the plantings like the English gardens used to have. Uh, he liked a more prairie style, which meant that you had wafts of varieties uh, planted in mass that would change color throughout the year, sort of like a prairie does. <coughs> and so that was the original intent of the design. <coughs> um, uh, like I said, the beds are laid out in specific shapes to create those rooms. Um, the arborvitae sort of anchor the beds so that you can define the beds when you're looking in the garden and you're walking around the garden. Um, and there was also Mrs. Uh, Douglas was a, was a fan of peony and so she has uh, hundreds, you know, hundreds of peonies lining uh, many of these beds, some of which are still there today. Um, and she used to like to, uh, she liked the massive colors of the same color and so each bed has uh, pretty much massive colors uh, or the same color, individual color. <coughs> Um, and she would time her return back to uh, Cedar Rapids because they had a home in Santa Barbara as well to sort of coincide with, with the peony going into bloom. Um, <coughs> let me see, we have about 300 to 400 annuals that we also plant in the formal gardens and uh, throughout the ground each season. And um, we also, uh, there was, there's some historic roses in the garden that I've discovered from the Rose Society uh, back when I first started. Some of them weren't in such good shape. Um, you know, the deer are pretty, pretty hard on roses and we have lots of deer there. Um, so we're trying to restore some of those, bringing back some of the old garden roses that are uh, of the time. Um, so every year I add a couple of those and especially the ones if they're uh, dying out. <coughs> and we also have two, seasonal gardeners that help me out. 
Uh, they start usually around March, the beginning of March, about part-time, and then they'll work with me all the way through November, generally. Um, let's see, where am I here? <coughs> what slide I'm on here? Um, so yes, sorry, let me flip back. This is the garden in spring. Um, again, you can see the uh, massive plantings there. This is one of my favorite times of year in the garden because uh, there is these Shasta daisies or Memorial Day daisies that go into bloom first. And that little purple is the Nepeta there. Some of them died out this past year. This was taken uh, this summer, as you can see. But the idea is that waft of color. And then as these start to die out, we have Larkspur that come up and uh, many of the, the later spring uh, perennials start coming up, the, peony, the roses, I'm sorry to say, um, and, um, and also uh, lots of salvias and yarrow and butterfly bush. So throughout the season, the garden changes. So I always encourage people to come out there and look through the garden different times of year. Um, uh, there's lots of woody perennials in there as well, uh, but we also add uh, annuals every year. Um, this is a very high maintenance type of garden. <laughs> Uh, especially with these sizable perennial beds, because we do most of the weeding just by hand. We don't um, use any sort of uh, chemicals uh, in the garden, um, because we have a lot of annuals that reseed themselves in there, like the larkspur that I have that come up every year. We have poppies that come up every year. And so I don't want to um, put any sort of pre-emergence to keep those weeds out. And uh, I'm amazed, because I'm originally from California, but I'm amazed at how quickly weeds grow here <laughs> in Iowa. <laughs> Um, so it's a full-time job, uh, really, just to keep maintain those beds. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful job, <coughs> to be quite honest. Um, this, again, is some more pictures of how we've tried to maintain a prairie-style landscape. Uh, again, you've got a mix of perennials in here. There's some sedum in there, and then there's some zinnias and gomfrina in here with roses in the background. These are some lupin that uh, we added to the garden about five years ago, uh, and uh, flocks back there in the sum later in the summer uh, on one of the beds. But you can see the different heights. There's different textures. Um, there's uh, different colors, different species. Um, and uh, that's what makes it interesting to me, and that's what I think uh, Mrs. Douglas liked about gardening, is to have that kind of space so you can try these different and interesting um, plants. Again, here's another example of, of what a prairie style is. It almost looks a little bit out of control <laughs> to some degree, but these are all annuals that reseed in the garden, which is why I don't want to, except for the butterfly bush here. But uh, this is a snow on the mountain, and we have verbena, and we have celosia. These all sort of reseed right there in this part of the garden. This is actually the cutting garden, uh, which has changed every year, and I have more slides of that, of what it's like inside that cutting garden. But that was part of... Uh, the original design of the plan uh, was to have a cutting garden and a vegetable garden, not only for the family, but also for the community as well, which we still um, <coughs> keep up with today. We still, we still keep doing that. Um, but again, it's that swath of mass plantings that you can see there, and um, that's the prairie-style um, landscape. At the time, which, which is kind of interesting if you read some old garden history books, uh, there was sort of uh, this uh, revolt uh, in the garden industry, if you will, about uh, that this wasn't a formal garden with, with all this kind of wild look to it, that it should be more um, uh, defined, uh, limited to the plant material, which is more of what uh, Mrs. Hall changed the garden to, <coughs> and we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes here. Uh, but this is, again, the garden in uh, 1920, and you can see um, the rustic prairie style in all the plantings, and also the room that he created with this uh, arbor that went all the way around the perimeter of the garden at the time. Um, uh, it was uh, a way to create a room, which is one of his uh, ideas in his uh, entire, entire plan. Um, so the Hall tradition, um, let me see if I can find this uh, note here. Um, in the Hall, the Halls 
sort of changed the garden a little bit. <clears throat> um, they took away that rustic fence, uh, probably because it was rustic and, and starting to fall apart. <laughs> and they had replaced it, you can sort of see it here in this photograph, with a different kind of fence, but sort of to create the room, but also to open up uh, the garden more. Um, they also changed the plantings to less of a prairie style plantings and more of a what, what, what she thought of as a more of a formal garden in terms of the way it's planted. Um, <clears throat> you can see it's more of a manicured look. Um, in this one they have solid rows of tulips coming up there. She kept the peony. She had many more roses. She had probably over um, 400 or 500 roses. And this is the time that Don Novi, who your friend was, was tending to the garden. Um, <clears throat> but it had a much more formal look. Uh, far less perennials. She had more annuals in there, and she had many, many more roses than we have today. Um, the yep, that's that's his work right there, actually. Mm -hmm. So, and this was uh, so. Then, when uh, she bequeathed the, the property to the National Trust, um, they went back to the more uh, because they wanted to make the Douglas era the interpretive era because the Douglases had so much influence on the actual whole estate, not just on the, the house. Um, so we went back to, to this prairie style landscape. And again, here's the difference. This is in 2014. These are larkspur that just come up every year. Uh, they reseed themselves. There's uh, Alcamilla mollus, or lady's mantle in there. There's a lot of salvias in here and uh, yarrow, but it's just a massive planting, and what I love about it is how it changes color throughout the year. One of my favorite things about that garden is that it does that, just that. <clears throat> um, here we have uh, arborvitae as being part of the original design. These arborvitae, which is this cone-shaped plant there that you see, uh, we replaced those in 2007, I think. They had become these little mob balls. <laughs> And part of the original design was to have them more uh, columnar like that. So we um, replaced those. And uh, now we trim those, and I trim them, and I've been able to keep them that size, but we trim them about three or four times a year throughout the, the season. Um, and so that's just another example of how the garden looks uh, today. Part of O.C. Simon's designs, which I think is really interesting, is this uh, room, room concept. Um, it was part of a country design uh, of the estate. Um, he liked there to be discovery, like uh, when you would walk through the estate or drive through the estate, he liked having winding paths, and he would like you to find uh, an area that all of a sudden seems as though you're not even in the same property. And this is one of my favorite examples of, of a room concept. This is where our classics theater uh, happens every summer, and uh, those back trees there uh, pretty much surround the area, um, to the left of that stage is where you enter, but uh, there's woodland up from where, this from where this picture is taken behind this photographer, there would be woodland. So it's this huge room, and uh, we're able to see 200, 300, 500 people in there. Um, and uh, it's just a perfect example of, of a room concept, and I, and I think uh, it's very interesting. I, I mean, I, these, I was never really kind of exposed to that kind of uh, idea in designing a country state. Of course, I don't have a lot of country estates to design, but, but, but it's just, it's, it's amazing the kind of work he does. And when I go to like the old Oak Hill Cemetery or other parks that he's designed, you can see that same sort of influence. And it really makes a difference in how the estate was planned <coughs> and how the estate looks and feels. Um, this is our Bruce Moore front lawn. This is a huge, another huge example of the room concept. There's this vast open space. The perimeters have all sorts of trees and shrubs usually natives. Uh, the sky is the ceiling, and then that lawn there is, th is the floor. Um, and uh, you can see this picture was taken circa 1910, I believe. This was last summer. Uh, there's even been some changes uh, to this since this picture was taken. Actually, there's a, a big conifer there that we've taken out to open up that view, not only because it was dying, but also because it sort of uh, encroached on the the house, you can't see it from the, from the street so much. Um, there was a dying portion of this tree over here, you can kind of see that dead limb hanging out there, that's now gone. And this tree here is sort of on its way out, it's, a, it's some sort of an oak, 
which might come out too. But those are the kind of things that you have to think about uh, when, you're, when you're working at this uh, estate because uh, this is the original picture, which is fairly close still to what we have going on today. <coughs> um, there is an orchard too. <coughs> Uh, and this is another sort of uh, a room concept. Um, this is tucked away just uh, northwest of the mansion, and there's about four to five different apple varieties in there. Uh, we've got two to three pear varieties in there. We have cherry trees, we have peach trees, and we have plum trees. Uh, the perimeter, again, is planted with trees and shrubs, um, creating that room. Again, there's over 40 fruit trees in our orchard. Uh, this, um, they were sort of left untended when I first came. So uh, one of my first jobs as uh, assistant gardener when I was first hired was to uh, start to maintain the, the orchard. Um, and so I prune that every February, end of February, beginning of March. I usually go through and prune them. I don't prune them so much for fruit production as for aesthetics, um, although they're pretty much coincide. I, I still get a lot of fruit off of most of them. Um, <coughs> And 25% or so of the trees, I th I'd say, are from the Hall era. There's one or two trees from the Douglas era. Unfortunately, there were some straight line winds that came through in 2003 and knocked down all the old trees. So these now are replanted in just the year before I came, which is about 2003, um, 2004, somewhere in there they were replanted. And you can see the different sizes. And by the trunks, you can see the different ages of the trees. And then um, we lost some more and some, some frost and some wind damage. Um, and so uh, it's, again, it's a constant cycle of replacing the trees. But, um, <coughs> but it's historic, the actual place. Um, the actual trees, unfortunately, are not. But I can justify that in that Mrs. Douglas, I think, would want to try different kinds of varieties of trees. Some of the varieties of trees that are listed, although it's kind of hard to find, there's very little documentation about what actually was planted in the orchard at that time when the Douglases were there. But uh, I still figured she would want to try the new varieties. And some of the varieties that they've had on the list that I've been able to find, you can't find anymore. <coughs> so that's another issue. But the fruiting time on here is about May to October. The cherries and the plums are first. Um, and then the pears and the apples ripen in the summer. But it's a really neat part of the estate. That's the one of the part of the estates where I usually sneak off to have lunch because nobody knows it's there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't, but now, <laughs> now they may. Um, so we also have a pond. Uh, this was installed circa 1910, the pond was. Um, part of having a country estate was to have uh, recreational activities. So there was boating and there was ice skating on the pond. Uh, swimming took place on the pond. Um, there's an early photo of the pond here, which I think is really neat. These are children skating on the pond. Uh, that's taken during the Douglas era. And then we have that, that photo on the right there uh, was taken more towards the Hall era. Uh, they had swans. There's also these beautiful urns. I don't know if you can see them in that photograph, but at the very end of the pond there, there's these beautiful urns that Mrs. Uh, Douglas purchased in 1924 or 25 from an artisan in... Uh, Maryland, I believe, and uh, they were placed there to, because as you drove in from Linden Drive, you can't really see it in this picture, but she could look through across the pond and right onto the house. Now everything is sort of uh, grown in. You can't really see that same view, but uh, that was the purpose of those, of those being there. And this is one of our next big restoration projects um, because it... Uh, it just needs to be uh, dredged and restored to this uh, era. Um, we have some issues with it, and we're trying to figure out some biological controls. Uh, it's basically just sitting water, so um, we're consulting with people. But we don't think we'll ever start on this project anytime soon, maybe 2017 or 18. Um, but that's one of our big projects to come up soon. Um, we also have a woodland area. <clears throat> this is the Linden Drive entrance, which is the uh, main entrance to the estate. Um, and on either side there was woodland. Uh, this was taken um, circa 1910, this picture, and this was about 2010. So not too much of a difference there has changed. Uh, when they were putting in uh, the road, uh, after doing some research with, uh, on O.C. Simons and how uh, they've done 
roads in the past, whether it was blacktop or what kind of material would you <laughs> use for the road, uh, the recommendation from the historic landscape report that was done then was to have a regular dirt road still going through there. Uh, that wasn't really practical because they're in the middle of the city now. Um, so they put this aggregate as the road, which makes it look like a dirt road. It gives you that same sort of feel, which was a good uh, compromise. But again, when you're working with a historic estate, those are the kinds of things you, wanna, you do want to think about because a blacktop would really change the look of the, of the place. And uh, part of O.C. Simon's design was to make it as natural as possible. Um, even the buildings are painted a certain color so that they blend with the estate. <coughs> so those are the kind of things you've got to think about uh, when you're going forward with this estate, uh, or historical estate. <coughs> this is the uh, woodland areas, which is uh, one of my favorite areas, too, of the estate. Um, there's uh, woodland areas to the north and uh, south of... Uh, of the estate, and uh, it's a beautiful place to walk through. This is early spring. Uh, the whole floor of the, f of the woodland area is covered with these bluebells. It's just a solid, uh, massive blue. Um, and then uh, later in the season, uh, some of the May apples come up, and uh, the trees start to come in. There's uh, different native shrubs in there. Uh, there's some uh, red buds, um, different kind of native uh, flowering perennials and annuals <coughs> that come up every year. Part of the design, again, for this estate was to keep part of it just natural and woodland. Um, there's lots of deer that live in our woodland areas. There's uh, badgers, and or not badgers, but um, they remind me of badgers. Can't think of their name right now. Woodchucks. Lots of woodchucks. <coughs> Keeping us busy. So it's really important to figure out how we're going to care for this historic estate, which is why we had this uh, historic landscape report done. Uh, this is going to help us going forward um, in terms of our treatment plan, our maintenance plans, um, our documentation. They created this map for us, <coughs> which has the estate sort of zoned out. Um, and we use these zones, it's really helpful when we're communicating with each other or documenting any activity on the estate um, or changes to the grounds. Um, it's also helpful to see the snapshots as well as that larger picture when you're uh, preserving the estate. Um, the, the landscape in one zone could have an effect on the landscape in the other zones. Um, and how does the interpretive era affect the landscape decisions when you uh, need for re-landscaping is called for? Um, the halls made significant changes, but they're still part of the history there. Uh, Bruce Moore Inc., which runs the estate now, we've made some other changes to the landscape, but it's still part of the history. Um, again, here we go to the front lawn, uh, which we have different treatment plans and different maintenance plans for just this little room. Uh, we go tree by tree, figure out which ones can stay, which ones need to go, how healthy are they. Uh, we have some ash trees planted in there amongst those. Some arborists are telling us, well, you need to take those out right away. Um, but they're beautiful, healthy trees, so, and old trees. So um, these are the challenges uh, to try to decide uh, how we maintain these, uh, this space. <coughs> uh, again, this is the garden zone. Um, it's the most visited place on the ground. Um, the halls made significant changes to this area, and the rustic fence is now removed. Uh, the room sort of is gone. Um, the black top driveway was installed during the hall era, which is now gone. Um, <coughs> there's a pool house that was put near the pond. Um, again, this is more slides of the estate. You can see this is the, the formal garden now, and that rustic fence that separated it from the, from the mansion is gone. Um, and it's almost the same room. Um, some of the changes we made, like this wisteria, for example, we put that there to soften the building because it's all part of the one same room now. Um, but that wasn't original. That's something that, that we installed. Um, and what's interesting is we have this pool rehabilitation project, my first rehabilitation project since becoming the head gardener. And it's interesting because you have all these eras colliding. And, uh, you know, you have the pool from the hall era, uh, you have the pool house from the hall era, 
You have the basic design that's in the Douglas era. Um, so how, when we go to restore, we're taking out one of the walls and we're uh, re-tuck pointing the side of the mansion. Um, and then we need to re-landscape it. <coughs> my my uh, theory was to go back to all the Douglas era photographs and sort of recreate what they created. Um, but that pool wasn't there. The hall's put in that pool, but yet we, we've thought about taking out that pool, but again, that's part of the history of the estate. And it's also a really neat piece. It's very kind of an art deco kind of piece, and so um, you can't just take that out. But if we were to actually restore it to the 1910 era, this is how it basically looked, which would mean this pool is just a waiting pool. Um, this wall that we're going to be taking out, <coughs> or taking down, was actually in this picture, I'm trying to find the picture of it, but starts, it's kind of hard to tell, but it starts right here, which is much farther down on the mansion than where the wall is today. Um, <coughs> and so when we restore that wall, we're not gonna restore it quite to the 1910 era, um, but, the, but the plantings, um, the room, that's what I'm gonna try to create again because it's lost some of that. <coughs> um, this is also our um, vegetable garden. Uh, we use this based on historical use. Um, this year we grew sunflowers. Uh, I just wanted to show that picture because I was amazed at how tall that sunflower became. Um, <clears throat> we grew corn in there too, uh, basil, um, tomatoes, and all the vegetables are uh, harvested for the SAF and for uh, Foundation 2 in Cedar Rapids. Um, we give our, our uh, access to them as well. And that was a tradition of the hall that the Douglases started. This is uh, the cutting garden. This is a, uh, <clears throat> historically how it was used. It was just rows and rows of annuals. I plant about seven or six different rows of annuals uh, for the cut, cut flowers. We do have a flower shop and they use most of my material for filler because it's really not florist quality. Um, <clears throat> but the staff uses that. We also um, spread the joy to whoever comes to visit. Usually when people go on landscape hikes with me, we can we cut some flowers from there. Uh, this is the courtyard of the carriage house. This is our uh, administrative building. Uh, we have a museum store and we have exhibits in this um, building. This used to be the uh, tool shed um, and it was even used up till, uh, I, I can't remember exactly the date when they, do you remember Candy, when they actually put this building together when when the administrative building like 18 years ago. yeah it was only like 18 yeah when about when Kelly started so it was only been a uh, so it was still used by uh, my boss at that time as our maintenance building <clears throat> it's a carriage house one of my favorite buildings on the estate actually um, but it uh, has changed purposes um, this is our new Ludy Greenhouse uh, and uh, our new maintenance building. Uh, since that carriage house houses our administrative area, they, create, they built this building. Um, again, this is a, a change that the National Trust to Historic Preservation made to the estate. This wasn't something the halls put in. Um, but as the um, events grew, they needed more space. That Lord and Burnham Greenhouse, which I'll show you in a minute here, uh, started to uh, go into disrepair, so they needed a new greenhouse, um, and they built this, uh, I think it's about 900 square foot greenhouse, <coughs> um, and that's where most of my production happens today, and then we have another maintenance building, another garage, so to speak, put there. <coughs> this is the old Lord and Burnham greenhouse, uh, now fully restored um, with the cold frames. This is a servant's duplex, which is part of the estate. Um, where the servants, uh, the head gardener used to live in one of these duplexes and was, it was his job to keep that um, Lord and Burnham greenhouse going throughout the winter as well as the mansion. Um, so he had a year-round job <coughs> and uh, living space. Um, we restored this greenhouse uh, just recently, two years ago, 2011, I think it was, 2011, 2012, um, when the, let's see if this next photograph, yeah. Uh, <coughs> this was um, what it looked like before we restored it. Uh, it started to go in big disrepair. And what we found out when we started to restore this was they uh, were looking at 
the greenhouse and realize that part of this greenhouse, the second part of the greenhouse, was actually added on to the original um, greenhouse during the Hall era. And most of the uh, metal that was in there was from uh, Hall uh, ironworks. And um, these cold frames that you see on the side were added at that time. So when we went to restore it, again, 1910 is our interpretive era, we're thinking, well, how do we do this? Do we restore the whole greenhouse? Do we cut off the part that the halls added since it wasn't original? Um, what do we do with all those materials that we're going to be taking from the greenhouse? Do we save them? Do we throw them away? Um, <coughs> and those decisions to me are a little hard because, again, that's part of the hall era. It's part of the estate. The ultimate decision was to remove the addition, restore it back to the 1910 era, which I'm going to go back to that other photograph, and you can see those cold frames were part of the, in 1910, that's where the cold frames were. It was only this one section of the greenhouse. The halls had actually added that other section of the greenhouse, so we took off that and put the, the cold frames, took them off of the greenhouse and put them back to the 1910 era style of the, green, of the, the estate. Um, <coughs> I think it was probably the right decision to make. Um, uh, it, it tells the story of the, the, the Douglas era. But, it, but we also, whoops, but we did save all of the um, material that we took out of that greenhouse because that's, again, part of the history. Uh, what we'll do with it, who knows. <laughs> but it's still kind of neat. We've made different kinds of things out of it. <clears throat> so um, this is Bruce Moore um, today. Um, in 1981, like I said, Mrs. Hall bequeathed the, the property of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. <clears throat> Again, for a cultural center, uh, not so much as a shrine to her family. Um, currently, it is preserved and operated by a private nonprofit organization, and that's Bruce Moore, Inc., which is uh, the staff. That's us. Um, there's uh, 12 full-time regular staff, and then we add another three seasonal people um, there's an intern that comes in and helps with all the summer events, and then I have two seasonal gardeners um, that help us uh, <coughs> as well. Um, we rely on memberships, uh, donations, grants uh, to continue with our restoration and our preservation of the property. Uh, we offer, offer um, a lot of cultural programs. One of my favorites here is the plant sale. Offer this every the first of every uh, the first weekend in May, usually Mother's Day, the the day before Mother's Day. Um, the proceeds from which usually help me and the garden um, to restore. This is inside the uh, Lord and Burnham greenhouse. We have it over by the Lord and Burnham greenhouse now. Um, I would highly encourage you all to come check it out. Um, I think it's May 9th this year. Uh, we also have balloon glow, which is another kind of uh, famous event. But again, everybody, this is on First Avenue Lawn, so it's that huge room. It's just uh, full with people. Um, and this happens every summer. Uh, it's a Freedom Festival event. It's actually not our event. They uh, sort of rent the space, if you will. Um, <clears throat> but it's one of the highlights of the summer around Cedar Rapids. People love to come and watch these balloons just glow. <clears throat> um, this is our classics at Bruce Moore, and we have a children's theater. Again, this is that room I was telling you about. You can kind of see how we use um, the estate. Um, we also have a Bruce Moore Garden and Art Show, which happens at the end of August. Uh, it gives people a chance to come out to the garden. We have master gardeners giving presentations all day. We have three or four different master gardeners in the garden to talk to people as they come and look at the plants and ask questions. Um, <coughs> We have, this is uh, another view of the, of the garden. Um, so we have lots of, of, of events and programs, uh, including Bruce Orchestra, we have Scarecrow Invasion, just a ton of things. Um, <coughs> tours of the mansion and the estate uh, of, and the neighborhood, we, we offer tours of the mansion and the estate, the neighborhood. Um, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, basically, from 8 to 5, and Sunday is about 10 to 4. Um, Mondays is the only days we're closed. Um, and when the gates are open, which is usually dawned about dusk, you're uh, free to roam the grounds. There's no charge for that. Um, but we do encourage membership. 
Um, private donations are always welcome. Um, but regardless, I think you all should come out to Bruce Moore and explore. <coughs> uh, again, I'm really thankful that Mrs. Hall left this to us, uh, and she would want everybody in the community, and even in Iowa City, to come and visit us, check it out. Um, these are some of the events that we have coming up this year. I have a uh, calendar of events here uh, on this table, as well as some other brochures about Bruce Moore. You can also sign up for an e-blast, these little pink slips. If you want to sign up and stick it in that box there, we can put you on our e-blast. Um, but I hope it was enjoyable. I hope you'll come and visit us at Bruce Moore sometime. And I really thank you for this opportunity. Oh, and they know about the mansion tours? I've got 50 tickets here. These are free mansion tours to all of you who, as long as they last, uh, this will give you a chance to come out and tour the mansion, okay, when we open in March. And then we have a raffle for some of my, if you want to hear me blab some more, I give these uh, landscape hike in March, uh, and I have a landscape hike in April, and Bruce Moore and Bloom in May. So <clears throat> I'd love to see you out there. You can walk the estate. Be ready to walk. And you heard him talk about the sale on May 9th. Of course, you're going to the Project Green sale first. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, and go to the Project Green. And then head to Cedar yeah. Rapids. <laughs> Just thought I'd mention that. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> if you could please take your seats, we'll start the question and answers. Okay, the first question that we received is, it's, they asked, what do you do with the fruit from the orchards? Um, Candy makes us uh, <laughs> apple crisps. <laughs> and, and, Can um, and Candy was a former student of mine from Tipton in home economics, so she's got great background. See, right. She knows how to do that. Um, we also donate some of it. Um, a lot of it actually falls to the ground and the squirrels eat. Um, but we, uh, the ground staff usually goes in there and harvests and eats. Uh, people, we encourage visitors to grab an apple and eat. Um, we're trying to have, it would be neat to have some sort of a harvest festival there, but um, I can't, you know, Mother Nature is just, she blooms when she wants to bloom. The fruit get produced when they want to get produced, so it's hard to say on October 10 we'll be able to pick fruit. Because some years you can and some years you can't, so. But we're trying to work on something like that. <clears throat> and then we also, I harvest it and give it to the foundation too as well. Do you use volunteers to weed, help with simple gardening tasks? Absolutely, I do. Uh, you can get a hold of me. I usually uh, put a call out on a Monday and I'll say, this is where we're going to be. Uh, I usually have my volunteers help me out um, in the mornings, usually about 9 until about 11 in the morning, and then it usually gets a little too hot for most people. But if you get like six or seven people out there on a bed, you can have it done in you know, 20 minutes. Um, and so, yes, yes, I do. Uh, and you can get a hold of me at david at brucemore.org, very okay. simply, and I'll put you on my email list. How do you do side color palettes for the annuals, and is it historically based? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> I usually, um, I definitely try to pick, each bed sort of has its own little color palette. And so that's kind of where I start, and that is basically historical. But then uh, there's times when we'll want to try something new, like a new annual, and so I'll massively plant it out in the bed. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I have a lot of vendors that like to give me samples of things that I can try out and sort of do a test garden in my bed. So um, I try to stay as historical as I can, but also knowing that du Mrs. Mm -hmm. Douglas would probably want to encourage mm -hmm. new things mm -hmm. as well. This question is about... Is it lupine? Mm -hmm. Is that how it's pronounced? How do you keep them going from year to year? They don't seem to be very happy in our climate. They aren't. <laughs> um, I found these seeds, um, they, are, they are a little difficult. I found these seeds, uh, Russell hybrids, uh, and those seem to be, that's what that picture of, uh, it was a Russell hybrid um, that was on that picture. And those seem to be able to tolerate our climate although um, I do usually lose one or two every fall or every winter. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I also cover them up a little bit, and, the, and they're also sort of um, protected because they're planted amongst other perennials, so they're not just out in the open there. Mm -hmm. um, they're supposedly harder to zone for, but 
you know, uh, I love them. They were part of uh, the original design. Um, I found them in some notes of Mrs. Douglas, so that's why I started entering, putting some of them in. And again, the Russell hybrids are, are what I'm sticking with, so I would suggest finding those if you can. I started them by, plant, by seed, <clears throat> and I start them in the greenhouse. I grow them for a year, and then I plant them in the garden. So I'll grow them for a whole year. They're already two years old before I put them in the garden. Yeah, greenhouse. Uh, the flowers? Uh, I would say uh, they're short-lived perennial, three or four years. I have some in there that are about four years old. So if they die out, don't feel bad. Yeah. Again. Yeah. <laughs> it says, are there visits planned by Iowa Public Television or Victory Garden? Victory Garden host Thompson was at Bruce Moore in the past. Yeah, he was. He was our speaker at the Garden and Art Show a couple years ago. I think he was our last speaker. But no, we... Um, no. <laughs> uh, we've had the news come out a couple times during our like a uh, garden and art show promo once. They were out. They came out. But no, uh -uh. I, I don't know of any documentaries or public television deals out there. And this is this site is the um, only national. It's o the only site national in trust Iowa. In Iowa. In Iowa. So mm -hmm. that should bring some. Yeah. yeah. Do you live at Bruce Moore, and how many? Uh, how many do live there? I do not live at Bruce Moore. I lived there for uh, about six, well, actually it was only about three months uh, when I was selling a house and buying a new house. Um, the superintendent of the grounds does live there. He's lived there for, gosh, a good 20 years, I want to say. Um, he does live on the estate. And then uh, we have our uh, director of education and, I don't know, she has a big title. But she, um, <laughs> director of education and, yeah, collections. and collections, she lives on the uh, estate. At the, there's a house called the Garden House, which is another house on the estate that she lives in. So, okay. <clears throat> so it's two people live on the estate. Okay. Have you already chosen or hired your seasonal gardeners for 2015? <laughs> <laughs> Looking for job prospects? Or um, no, uh, I, I am actually searching for a new, I have one seasonal gardener that left me this year. He went to Chicago. Um, so I am looking to hire somebody this year. I'm taking resumes through uh, August, uh, August uh, February 13th. So if, oh. you wanna, if you wanna apply, you got another, you got another week. Next Friday, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I've gotten some, some really pretty good applicants, so. Good. But I would encourage you to apply. The more the better. Where do the names Bruce Moore, Lord Burham, come from? Uh, Bruce Moore is uh, Douglas Bruce. Mm -hmm. Okay, I always have to think about this. George Bruce Douglas. Mm -hmm. uh, it was his middle name was Bruce, and the Moore refers to his heritage, which is the Moors of Ireland, right, Candy? Scotland. Scotland, I mean. So Bruce Moore, he called it Bruce Moore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Lord. And the Lord and Burnham yes. is Lord and Burnham was a company that built greenhouses in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that was the name of the company, Lord and Burnham Greenhouse. So oh, okay. that greenhouse we have is an actual Lord and Burnham Greenhouse. What type of wisteria did you plant? Is it invasive or destructive, and how do you control its growth? <laughs> well, uh, it's, a, it's a Chinese variety. Uh, I can't think of the variety name right now, I'm sorry to say. It is invasive. It is very hard to control. Uh, we keep it off of that. Um, we have it on the pergola or the portico share, but I prune it probably during the growing season uh, at least six or seven times. Oh um, <clears throat> so I let it bloom and then I cut it back pretty far and then it just grows these wild little runners all over the place and so uh, you just keep it pruned. Um, and it is very high maintenance plants, but um, I'm just trying to think of the variety name and I can't think of what the variety name is right now. But um, it is hardy here, obviously. Uh, it blooms beautifully uh, in the spring and summer, but I'd be careful where I planted them, to mm -hmm. be honest. It sounds like, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Has somebody thought of something? They did, oh, okay. Well, with the wisteria, I have one too, and then that is now making this, like you say, crazy vines all, mm -hmm. cutting down to the ground. Right on down to the ground. I, I try to keep one that would be the stock. Yeah. Anything that grows off of there, I keep off unless it's growing up where I want it to go. Oh, really? And then as those runners send out, you know, I just prune them all the way down to that, um, to that one cane that I'm trying to get to grow across the top of it. 
And then I, I just, it's just constant pruning on that thing because I don't want it to attach to the building and I don't want it to destroy the building. My predecessor actually planted it there and it made sense at the time, and, but now that it's getting big, I'm... Oh, it's beautiful. It is pretty. It is really pretty. High maintenance, I love but beautiful. It, but yeah, and I do love it. Okay. Oh, there's another question. Would you consider treating those ash with uh, new treatment? Uh? Yeah, we would. We definitely would. I hate to take them down just because, you know, if there's no... It may be inevitable, um, but these trees are so pretty in there. Um, the color in the fall is really pretty, and it's a nice mix of trees that we have along the alley there that I'd hate to have to take them down just to take them down. Um, but uh, I would like to. I, I would definitely be open to it. <laughs>